De pie, luchar, el pueblo va a triunfar, será mejor la vida que vendrá a conquistar nuestra felicidad y en un clamor mil voces de combate se alzarán, dirán canción de libertad con decisión la patria vencerá y ahora el pueblo que se alza en la lucha con voz de gigante gritando adelante el pueblo unido jamás será vencido the people united will never be defeated 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 good afternoon everyone buenas tardes we are here in front of the supreme court uh, very much in the tradition of hundreds and thousands of people in this country who have fought against injustice, who have demanded of our country a better union, who have fought again and again to protect one another and to demand that the promise of this country become available and real for all of us. Today, it is my great honor to help us tell the stories of why it is that the Supreme Court matters to the people of this country and why it is that President Trump's attacks on members of the Supreme Court, specifically on the women of the Supreme Court, Judge Sotomayor, Judge RBG, uh, and others uh, are not only unconstitutional but deeply against the mandate of the court to work for the people and not for the president. We understand President Trump is a bit confused about the Constitution. He may or may not have read it. Um, but we know that in this country, dissent is patriotic. We know that in this country, dissent is necessary. We know that in this country, dissent is the way that we force our country to become a better, more just society. It is in fact the only way that generations after generations of people have fought, who have fought to be included in the promise of freedom and, and democracy, have actually gained access to that promise. We know that we stand on the shoulders of uh, our elders who fought to end slavery, the elders who won the right to vote for women in this country, the elders who fought and won the right of LGBTQ families to be together and to have dignity. Uh, the people who are fighting today, every day, in every corner of this country to make sure that everyone has healthcare, to make sure that everyone has access to a good education, to make sure that everyone can control their bodies regardless of their gender identity, to make sure that everyone has rights in the workplace, to make sure that everyone has access to dignity. That's why we are here today, because we believe that dissent is not only patriotic, it is necessary to form this more perfect union that we are constantly trying to build. My name is Ana Maria Archila. I am the co-executive director of the Center for Popular Democracy, and I will be introducing you uh, to people, justice, warriors, uh, who with their stories, with their actions, with their marches, with their efforts, are actually making justice available to more of us. Um, before I start, I want to share who's here. Um, so we are here with organizations, members of organizations that are fighting to protect our planet. We are here with members of organizations that are fighting to make sure that all of us have healthcare in this country. We are, she, we are here with members of organizations who are fighting to make sure that immigrant families are safe and can stay together and can be free in the place we call home. We are here with members of organizations who are fighting uh, to make sure that LGBTQ families have dignity in the workplace and in our society. We are here with young people who are fighting against the gun 
violence in our country. Um, we are here uh, with people who are fighting to protect the rights of women to control our own bodies and our destiny. We are here because all of us believe that democracy is the way that we have to take care of one another. Democracy is the mechanism that we have to take care of the people we love, to protect the communities that we are part of, and to protect the generations that will come after us. And this is why we are in front of the Supreme Court, because the, se the functioning of our court is essential to the functioning of our democracy. And when Trump goes after members of the Supreme Court, he's doing the work that um, right-wing forces in this country have been doing for more than 40 years to erode our democracy, to um, erode the, not only the mechanism that we have to protect one another, but the ways in which we have, the, the main mechanism that we have to build the country of our dreams. Um, he wants to uh, make people fear each other, to make people turn against each other, and to make people turn inwards and um, stop believing that we actually have the ability to take care of each other and to build a society where that is the core mandate. Uh, but we are here because we believe that a new world is possible and that in fact we build this world by fighting together, by dissenting together, by standing by one another, um, by telling our stories, by organizing together, and by demanding of our court, of our elected, um, and of each other to uh, really embody uh, this idea of dissenting to not only build a good country, but actually to build a society and the world that we all deserve. So with that, I am going to start introducing some of the folks who are fighting in our communities to make sure that this promise of um, freedom and democracy is real. And the first person I'm going to call to the mic is Maricruz Abaca, who is the member, a member of CASA in Maryland, and she joins us here today. Marie Cruz, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so first of all, I'm gonna start by saying that my name is Marie Cruz, and the person who are standing in front of your cameras behind whatever opportunity you have to watch this video is I'm representing the people who are still afraid to show their faces, who are still afraid to say, I am a DACA recipient. So today, I can tell you that you can make a difference of the actions of those people who are afraid. I'm not afraid. You know why? Because I was afraid for many, many, many years. I came when I was 15 years old. And I was afraid to go to school because of the rejection that people was showing. So you can imagine a 15 years old thinking and feeling that you don't, be, you don't belong. So I can see the same feeling on those people who are still afraid to say, I'm a, I'm a DACA. I have a DACA. And I can say that enough is enough. We have to stop thinking that way. I am a DACA, but I want to invite all those people who are the same as I, I am, the status that I have, to say, this is a good opportunity to transform those, those, to transform those feelings into the opportunities that we really deserve. Mm -hmm. We were paying taxes for many, 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 many years. I have three kids, and for many years I didn't receive a penny mm. because I couldn't, because I was undocumented. And when I finally got my DACA, I had the opportunity to reserve, but, I, but it was fair. I can tell you, in 2016, DACA changed my life. I, I started to learn English, the language because I realized that I had an opportunity to go back to school. I have my associate degree last year. I am now pursuing my bachelor's degree yeah. <laughs> philosophy, law, and ethics because I have a dream still. Yeah. Yes, and I want to become a lawyer. Woo. Yes, I want to serve the country that once gave me the opportunity to become one of the members of this beautiful community. So I can tell you that we dreamers, we are not criminals. The only thing that we want is you to open your heart, open your arms and say you are welcome. And you do deserve the opportunity that you have. 
and back in November, that was my birthday, November the 12th, and I have the ever beautiful gift ever, ever. It was the first time that I was inside of the Supreme Court in front of the judges that I admire. And some others that I, I, don't, I don't get their views and I don't get their feelings towards the immigrant community. Immigrant community is not only composed by Mexicans, Hondurans, and the Spanish speakers. It's different, different countries. And I can tell you that that day inside, I just felt a very emotional. I just, I just felt like it was a dream, but at the same time, it was the saddest day ever. And the only thing when I came out, I, I saw the people outside, and I felt in my heart, remembered back on those days when the colored people was rejected. We are the ones now, and if we don't raise our voice, imagine what could happen. You know what changes, what changes took place? Because once that people raise their voice and say, enough is enough. So today, it is our opportunity to continue to fight for what we feel we deserve, and what we feel it is right. And once they're gonna realize that the economy of this country was, was it become better because of us, because of those people who are still, for those who are still not able to get those taxes returns. So imagine where the money goes. Yes. So I can tell you that having my three beautiful children, one who has ADHD, it allows me to go to bed, sleep peacefully thinking that my son, it is in this country, that is his home, yeah. where he deserves to have the right education, and where his mom is able to stay because of DACA. Yeah. This last week, I went to my fingerprints, for my fingerprints, and it's always that sensation, that feeling like, it's not because you are afraid of something. It's not because I'm gonna tell you that we are not criminals and we, when we go for fingerprints, we have to pass that back, that, that check background, making sure that we don't have no offenses. So we are people who deserve this. So today I can tell you that they will never forget that we are standing right here, not only for DACA, but many other people who deserve the same opportunity. Stay together. Mm -hmm. Please stay together and don't feel that we are, they are winning. They want, no matter what they want, because this country is based on history and today we are making history. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so when Trump attacks our courts, he, um, attacks the integrity of our judicial system. And the Supreme Court this year will make incredibly important decisions that will impact the lives of millions of people. It will decide whether DACA is constitutional or not, or whether it was constitutional for Trump to um, try to end it. Today, as we speak, there was the court heard a case on whether refugees have the right to seek um, to have their cases heard at the border or not. Um, the court will hear a case on the right to bear arms or um, the right to uh, live in a country where so many people decide that it is more important to have a gun than to have safety for our families. And to talk about that, I wanna invite uh, Jackson Middleman, who's one of the young people uh, one of the many young people that are leading the efforts to end gun violence in our country. He's a member of March for Our Lives. My name is Jackson Middleman. I am an 18 year old first year public policy and political science student here at American University in Washington, DC. I stand here today as someone who is devoting the rest of my life to ending the gun violence epidemic by fighting for legislative justice. I stand here as a member of the mass shooting generation, as one of many students who are scared to go to school but are now standing up to demand change. And as I stand here, I am a product of Newtown, Connecticut, where my friend Noah lost his life amongst 19 of his fellow classmates and six of his administrators and educators in Sandy Hook Elementary School on December 14th, 2012. Above all this, I stand here as an American 
concern for the future of my peers and my fellow citizens alike. I'm concerned not only for the epidemic of gun violence that takes 40,000 lives each year, but for the integrity of the Supreme Court of the United States, who with the cases before it, threatens to act contrary to the American people and acquaint even more young people with the horror of gun violence. If you had told my 11-year-old self that I would still be fighting, that I would still have to be standing here today, I wouldn't have believed you. I believed that the leaders of this country, the politicians and the judges would have, by now, ensured that what happened in my hometown would never happen again. But every year since I was 12, I've come to DC to lobby for sensible gun legislation with the hope that the people in power would finally hear our cries and stem our pain. And now, things are finally changing. We've made progress federally and in states across the country, but at this crucial point in our movement, and as we secure victories in public opinion, in Congress and in state legislatures, the gun lobby has turned their undemocratic focus to the courts. Today, as I speak, life-saving legislation is under attack by the gun lobby, one case of which is sitting inside the building behind us. The gun lobby, the NRA, and the Republicans that protect them often speak in the language of rights. They turn to a misinterpreted clause in a misinterpreted constitutional amendment to claim a right to unlimited violence. They'll tell us that what happened in my hometown, or Parkland, Florida, or every day in cities across America is necessary collateral for their right to bear arms. Well, I am here today to say that we know our rights. We know what right the first sentence in this country's founding document gives us, what right forms the basis of our Constitution and our country. We know that before any other right in this country, every single one of us is guaranteed the right to live. Mm -hmm. And we know that every day that this country allows 100 people to be shot and killed is a day that right is denied. Mm -hmm. The 20 elementary schoolers and six teachers at Sandy Hook were denied their right to live. The 17 students and teachers at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School were denied their right to live. Last week, five Corps employees in Milwaukee who were just doing their jobs were denied their right to live. The three men who died just blocks from here one week ago were denied their right to live. And my friend Noah, who was just six years old, who was trying to learn in school, he too was denied his right to live. And so, as the Supreme Court mulls New York State Pistol and Rifle Association versus the city of New York, its first Second Amendment case in a decade, they should understand what this decision will mean. Choosing to side with the NRA and the gun lobby by falsely expanding the right to gun, guns will ultimately come at the cost of our rights to live. More people will die. In the institution that guarantees impartiality, guarantees true independence from other branches of our government, I plead the Supreme Court to side with the people of this country over the malicious gun lobby, which seeks only to increase their profits, not justice nor to save any lives. The court should also understand that if they side with the NRA, they'll be doing so at a time when the vast majority of Americans believe in stronger gun safety laws. An unfathomable, an unfathomable decision like that would put the court in direct opposition to the American people, threatening the legitimacy of their institution as an apolitical one. Since I was 12 years old, I have fought for stronger gun safety laws. In the past two years, millions of people across the country have joined that fight. The court should leave this up to democracy unless it wants to lose its integrity for good. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I haven't forgotten this since I first heard this years ago. It reminds me not to stop fighting because we have an unchallengeable right to live which no gun lobby can take away from us. Ultimately, the American people will win because we have justice on our side. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jackson, for um, reminding us that it is our duty to fight. It is our duty to fight. Um, now I want to welcome Leslie Dock uh, from Protect Our Care. Uh, to the mic to tell us what what the court is about to do on healthcare and why it is that we needed to act with integrity. Thank you, and it's Woo! just Woo! wonderful to be out here today with the people leading the fight day after day, not just in Washington where you can get a little frustrated, uh, <laughs> but even more importantly back home where it really makes uh, a difference. So thanks to 
everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here with the fighters uh, because, unfortunately, there are plenty of fights to fight mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. And only if you get up and truly believe that you can fight and win uh, can you keep this up, and that's what we need to do, particularly in front of this building, which so much is at stake here. And it's a building, unfortunately, that in many ways now unites Americans because all of us have something to lose and something to protect uh, from the judges that uh, President Trump has put on this court and what they unfortunately stand for and the way they behave towards all of us uh, who are in need of justice and who are in need of democracy and be treated equally under the law, things they unfortunately don't really seem to take seriously or believe in. Uh, just today, the court agreed to take on uh, a lawsuit brought by President Trump and about 20 Republican governors and attorney generals around this country uh, because they want to take away people's health care. They want to take away the ACA from everyone. And what's at stake in that? What's at stake are 20 million Americans who lose their insurance, 135 million Americans with a pre-existing condition who will lose all of their protections, go back to a day where they could be denied coverage at all or just be charged whatever the insurance companies want to charge them. So many people depend on this law for health care, and now they want to take that all away. You know, they've tried to do that twice before. I had the honor of serving in the Obama administration to fight these issues, and I thought twice was enough, mm -hmm. um, where we had a sweat, and everybody who, who counted that law for their health care had to worry and sweat about what was going to happen to them, and we squeaked out a victory because it was the right thing to do. Now we're doing this one more time, and the president, of course, has chosen voluntarily to step into this rather than defend the laws of the land. He's in court trying to overturn the laws of the land. Um, and it is important and critical that this court take this up, not only to end the uncertainty, but really to protect the health care of hundreds of millions of Americans. And it's particularly important as we stand here today when this country is in the throes of what might be a major uh, corona outbreak where millions, uh, hundreds of thousands could be at risk. What this president wants to do is take anyone who's ever gets this disease and turn them into a person with a pre-existing condition. So that all, what he wants to do is take healthcare away from 20 million people who might need to go to the doctor, even for this particular reason. So that they have to worry about being at home with a sick child or a sick family member, but not be able to afford to go to the hospital, not be able to afford to be tested. And they have to take that worry with them every day. And that needs to stop. The one other good thing we hope about this decision today is it means that while um, the Republicans have succeeded in purposely postponing the, probably the oral hearing on this case until after the election, although not for sure, it's very likely that just if they, unless the court really pulls something out of their hat, that they'll have to put out their brief the court on where they stand during this election year. So we'll have, we'll, President Trump will be forced once again to go on record and tell people, unfortunately, where he stands and this administration stands. And so we'll all have a chance, once again, just like we did in 2018, to make this an issue that gets us justice at the ballot box, not just justice here at the Supreme Court. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. So, standing in the Supreme Court, in front of the Supreme Court is, um, not just a form of dissent, it is a form of, it, it is an act of love for our communities, for our families, uh, for the people across this country whose lives will be deeply impacted by the decisions of this court. Um, the decision to um, end the ACA will uh, harm hundreds of thousands of people. Um, the decision to end DACA will harm hundreds of thousands of young people and their families. Um, there is another um, case that's before this court, which is uh, a case about whether or not the civil rights law of 1964 covers, uh, includes protections from discrimination based on gen gender identity and sexual orientation and um, in the workplace. So I wanna ask my sister, Jocelyn Castillo, a member of Make the Road New York, um, to tell us why, to tell us her story and why this case is important for her. And I will be translating. Okay. 
Uh, muy buenas tardes, mi nombre es Jocelyn Castillo, represento a la comunidad TGNC de Nueva York, Made the Road Action y CPD Action. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Jocelyn Castillo, I represent the uh, gender non-conforming uh, community and a committee at Made the Road New York and CPD Action. Woo! Soy una mujer inmigrante trans, soy una mujer trans que viajó de la ciudad de Guatemala a Estados Unidos huyendo de la violencia que se vive en mi país. I am a transgender immigrant woman from who traveled from my country fleeing the violence in in my in my homeland. Uh, solo viajaba con la intención de estar en un espacio seguro y trabajar por mis sueños. I was only traveling or in this journey uh, seeking safety and uh, the pursuit of my dreams. Cuando empecé mi transición aquí en los Estados Unidos, me enfrenté al acoso y la discriminación laboral en la ciudad de Nueva York, aún siendo una ciudad santuario. Uh, when I started my gender transition, I experienced tremendous discrimination in the workplace in, in New York City, even in New York City, a place that is supposed to be our sanctuary. En lo personal, la realidad que se vive laboral como una mujer trans se ha aumentado mucho la retórica por la violencia que ha creado el presidente actual. Um, with the current president we have experienced, and his um, hateful rhetoric, we have experienced a lot more discrimination and violence. Me han sacado de dos trabajos diferentes por el hecho en uno de no ser un cocinero, ser hombre, y en el otro por no ser una mujer, ser mesera, de los cuales de los dos fui despedida. I was fired from two jobs. One, uh, because a job where I, I worked as a cook because I was not considered a man and I was fired from a job um, as a server because I was not considered a woman. Para una mujer transexual, las decisiones de la corte como el apoyo de los miembros de la corte es muy importante ya que la violencia en general se está viviendo a través de la organización que se vive en este momento. Uh, the decisions of the court are, of, are essential, are incredibly important for us because of the violence that we are living in this moment. Necesitamos espacios seguros para mí y para toda nuestra comunidad trans en general y que los, la, que los trabajos sean de igual manera como para una mujer como para un hombre. We need safety, uh, we need safe spaces for trans women, for transgender people, for gender non-conforming people, and we need a workplace that does not discriminate. Necesitamos un stop a esta retórica que se vive y la persecución que estamos enfrentando. Solo necesitamos un espacio seguro para vivir dignamente como una mujer trans que soy. Gracias. We need a stop to this rhetoric, this hateful rhetoric that is generating so much violence. We need safety, safe, safe places as transgender women, and I thank you all for being here. Thank you, Jocelyn, for leading us in this fight and for being such a fierce warrior. Um, I want to call to the mic Liz Butler from Friends of the Earth. Um, as we know, we are in a moment of incredible danger and urgency and crisis. Um, climate change is threatening uh, not just our lives, but the future of our planet. And uh, the Supreme Court is also uh, about to make a decision um, on a case about the environment. So I want to ask Liz to tell us why it is that we are here and why it is that we are dissenting today. Thanks a lot. My name is Liz Butler and I'm the Vice President of Organizing for Friends of the Earth. We're a global network um, that works to fight for a healthy and just world. The first thing I wanted to say is that we stand in solidarity on all these issues. There is no fighting climate change without fighting justice. There is no fighting for our planet without fighting for people. This is fundamentally about whether or not we value people over profit. So we stand on gender justice, we stand on the right for health care, we stand on the right to immigrants to move around the world as they see necessary. And we know that half the time the climate crisis is causing the crisis that is causing people to leave. And that we disproportionately see the impacts on communities of color and frontline communities in the United States and around the globe. We've seen the drive of the fossil fuel industry to say our profits matter more than anything. We've seen them poison communities just to make a quick buck. 
We've seen them go in and take land from indigenous communities, from farmers, from ranchers. We've seen them go in and clear cut areas. Over and over, it has been, we have every right to destroy communities no matter who we poison or what happens to what we leave behind. Right now, a week ago, we were here out in front, dozens of us fighting because the Supreme Court is actually considering letting the fossil fuel industry even take public land to build a pipeline. The Atlantic Coast Pipeline <laughs> is slated to cross the Appalachian Trail, which is the protected area and has been protected for many decades. And even that can't be left alone. They want the ability to just decide when they want your land, when they want the community land, when they want to poison your community, that they should be able to do it. Now, up to the lower courts have said no, no, and no. For the first time in a generation, the Supreme Court is considering a pipeline case. Unfortunately, it's not the last. There's multiple pipeline cases coming up in the coming months because the fossil fuel industry knows now that instead of having public servants go into the Supreme Court and saying, no, communities matter. No, you can't poison the communities. You can't take land at Standing Rock. You can't keep destroying things and causing the climate crisis that the Trump administration stood inside of that building and argued that the fossil fuel industry and the ability to build pipelines was more important than any protection, was more important than the communities. Now, we know that we have to keep fighting on this. As you've seen, people have been out in communities fighting pipelines across the US, across Canada, and around the world. They've been fighting fracking, they've been fighting all the devastation that the fossil fuel industry drives. They've been fighting not just to stop the climate crisis, but also to protect their communities. And this fight will have to continue because it's not gonna be, it's gonna be all of us that will stave all of us together. We know we have to stand up to the administration. We know we have to stand up to the fossil fuel industry, but they are driven by the same right wing greed that all of these issues are. So we will only win when we stand together, which is why we're proud to be here today. Thank you. I guess we should chant again. The people united will never be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. So to close us out, I wanna ask Katie O'Connor from Demand Justice to come to the mic. Um, Demand Justice has been leading this effort to protect our courts, to make sure that in our democracy we have courts that are working for the people and that are uh, advancing um, the efforts, the collective efforts, the efforts of generations to include more of us in the promise of freedom and democracy. And I'm so grateful for all the efforts of Demand Justice and for our partnership. Thank you so much, Ana Maria. Um, it is not easy having to follow all of these superstars, but I'm gonna give it a go. Um, and hopefully sort of tie together all the pieces that we've heard about today. Um, so I am Katie O'Connor, I'm senior counsel at Demand Justice. Um, I wanna thank everybody who's here and I definitely wanna take a minute to thank our, our partners, CASA, Center for De Popular Democracy Action, Friends of the Earth, March for Our Lives, and March for Our Lives DC, the National Council of Jewish Women, Protect Our Care and Women's March. Everything we do is more powerful because we do it together and we couldn't ask for better company in this fight. Woo! Donald Trump thinks he's king. He believes that every part of the United States government is a tool to do his bidding. And he believes that that includes the United States Supreme Court. That's why last week when Justices Sotomayor and when Justice Sotomayor had the audacity to point out that the conservative majority of the court treats one litigant, President Trump, more favor favorably than everybody else, Trump attacked her and her fellow justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Unfortunately, the court isn't doing much to push back against this conception that it exists to enable the president. Just today, just hours ago, it agreed to hear yet another challenge to the Affordable Care Act. Here's a law that's been around for 10 years. It's been tested twice in this court. 
and it has been wildly successful in improving access to health care across the country. But Trump and his Republican allies tried and failed to repeal the law in Congress, so they've come to the court again to do their dirty work. And the court is stepping up to the plate. Tomorrow, the court is hearing a challenge to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, an agency that was created to prevent banks and other lenders from taking advantage of consumers following the disastrous financial crisis 10 years ago. It's also been a huge success, recovering billions of dollars for tens of millions of Americans since its creation. But Trump and his conservative pro-corporate allies want to dismantle the agency, and they're using an absurd legal theory to ask the court to do it for them. Wednesday, the court's hearing a challenge to an abortion law out of Louisiana. This law has one purpose, and one purpose only, to shut down abortion clinics. Four years ago, the court struck down an identical law out of Texas. And under normal circumstances, it wouldn't waste its time hearing this Louisiana case. But Republicans think this is their court now, and the court isn't yet proving them wrong. So many of the court's cases this year look like attempts, to, like attempts at unpopular Republican policymaking rather than legitimate legal disputes. In October, the court heard arguments about whether federal law protects LGBTQ people from employment discrimination. In a normal world, the answer would be emphatically yes but this is Trump's world. The court is also considering whether it was legal for the Trump administration to end the DACA program, which is overwhelmingly popular and which has brought hundreds of thousands of young immigrants who know no other home than the United States out of the shadows. The court's also hearing yet another challenge to the Affordable Care Act's guarantee of coverage for birth control. You may remember that the Obama administration bent over backwards to accommodate employers who have religious objections to providing birth control for their employees. But this court has allowed the employers and the Trump administration to move the goalposts over and over again in order to deny life-saving access to health care. Incredibly, the court is even being asked to limit states' ability to prevent gun violence in a case challenging a law that was repealed by New York City before the court even agreed to hear the case. There's no reason the court should be involved in this dispute, except to do the work of the Republican Party. And finally, of course, in late March, the court will hear arguments in three cases where the president's lawyers claim that he is absolutely immune from criminal investigation or congressional oversight. President Trump thinks this is his Supreme Court. He handpicked Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, and now it's time for them to return the favor. Every case this term, including and especially this one that so personally and directly affects the president's powers, is an opportunity for the court to assert its independence or to do the president's bidding. Thanks again for being out here today, and I encourage you to be out here many more times before the term ends. The court needs to hear from us. It needs to know we're watching. Thank you. No somos uno. No somos cien. Somos millones. Cuéntanos bien. No somos uno. No somos cien. Somos millones. Cuéntanos bien. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Tell me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Si se puede.